guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we will be talking about irritable bowel syndrome, which is also commonly known as IBS. So let's get started. So what is irritable bowel syndrome? Irritable bowel syndrome is a common disorder that affects the large intestine. IBS is a mix of belly discomfort or pain that occurs together with troubling bowel habits. The patient may experience episodes of diarrhea or constipation or have a change in the aspect of their stool, meaning the stool could be more thin, hard, soft or even liquid-like. So from this definition of IBS, we get that it is a disorder of the colon or the large intestine that makes these patients experience abdominal pain together with constipation or diarrhea and even have a change in the aspect of their stool. So these are the three main symptoms that make up an irritable bowel syndrome. So let's talk a bit more about the signs and symptoms of IBS. The signs and symptoms of IBS may vary. The most common ones include abdominal pain, cramping or bloating that is typically relieved by passing a bowel movement, excessive flatulence, diarrhea or constipation, bloating and sometimes having mucus in the stool. So something interesting about these signs and symptoms is that you'll notice that it says diarrhea or constipation. So some patients who have IBS will experience diarrhea while others may experience constipation. And some patients may experience a mix of both with episodes of diarrhea and constipation. So in constipation predominant IBS, this is the explanation here. The food moves too slowly through the bowel and this causes constipation. So usually our digestive food enters the large intestine or the colon and it is propelled upwards via the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, down the descending colon, into the sigmoid colon, the rectum and is passed out through our anus. But this process in patients who suffer from constipation predominant IBS, this process occurs too slowly. And because these contractions that propel the food and digested matter throughout this colon is too slow, the patient will experience these bouts of constipation and constipation will be their primary symptom. But this process is the opposite in patients who have diarrhea predominant IBS. And in these patients, we have the food moving too quickly through the bowel and this causes a more watery, softer stool. So if you imagine these contractions being very quick and very powerful and trying to propel that food and digested matter faster and faster, through this area, it's gonna come out very soft and watery. And this is the difference between constipation predominant IBS and diarrhea predominant IBS. So now let's talk about the causes of IBS. The cause of irritable bowel syndrome is currently unknown. It is thought to result from a combination of abnormal gastrointestinal tract movements, increased awareness of bodily functions, and a disruption in the communication between the brain and the GI tract, meaning a nervous system dysfunction. Let's explain these further. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the muscle contractions in the intestine. The walls of the intestines are lined with layers of muscle that contract as they move food through the digestive tract. So this is the propelling mechanism that I was talking about. Contractions that are stronger and last longer than normal can cause gas, bloating and diarrhea. So this is what actually happens in those diarrhea predominant cases of IBS. Weak intestinal contractions can slow food passage and may lead to hard, dry stools. And this is the explanation for the constipation predominant IBS. Another cause of IBS could be the nervous system dysfunction. Abnormalities in the nerves in the digestive system may cause one to experience greater than normal discomfort when their abdomen stretches from gas or stool. Poorly coordinated signals between the brain and the intestines can cause the body to overreact to changes that normally occur in the digestive process resulting in pain, diarrhea or constipation. So if you look at this little image on my bottom left, we have here a portion of the colon and if you look here we have this little bubble which is just a magnified segment of a cross section of the wall of the bowel. And this image shows you quite clearly the amount of nerves that are found here. These nerves are very important because they transmit signals to and from the brain. 
telling our body when we are ready to pass stool, when we have a lot of stool in that segment, and if we have gas, when to pass gas. But what actually happens in these cases when we have a nervous system dysfunction is that these signals that are transmitted are more intense than they need to be. So the patient may have small amounts of gas in stool in that portion of the colon, but because of these intense signals that are being transmitted, the brain interpretation of this is that there's large amounts of stool and large amounts of gas, and it's a bit of an overreaction of the nervous system. So that's basically how the nervous system abnormality can cause IBS. Continuing with causes, we can also have inflammation of the intestines. Some people with IBS have an increased number of immune system cells in their intestines. This immune system response is associated with also causing pain and diarrhea. Another cause could be severe infection. IBS can develop after a severe bout of diarrhea, for example, in cases of gastroenteritis caused by bacteria or a virus. IBS may also be associated with surplus of bacteria in the intestines, meaning bacterial overgrowth. And finally, another cause of IBS could be changes in the bacteria in the gut, meaning the microflora. Microflora are the good bacteria that reside in the intestines and play a key role in health. Research indicates that microflora in the patients with IBS might differ from the microflora in healthy people. So now let's talk about some triggers of IBS. Food. Many people have worse IBS symptoms when they eat or drink certain foods or beverages, including wheat, dairy products, citrus fruits, beans, cabbage, milk, and carbonated drinks. Stress. Most people with IBS experience worse or more frequent signs and symptoms during periods of increased stress. Something to note here, however, is that while stress may aggravate the symptoms of IBS, it does not cause them. So if you notice, stress was not put in the cause category, but it's put in the trigger category. So it's not a cause of IBS, but it can trigger episodes of IBS. And another trigger could be hormones. Women are twice as likely to have IBS, which might indicate that hormonal changes may play a role. Many women find that signs and symptoms are worse during or around their menstrual periods. So now let's talk about the diagnostic criteria for IBS. There are two specific criteria that can help a physician in the diagnosis of IBS. The first one we'll talk about is the Rome criteria. This criteria includes abdominal pain and discomfort lasting on average at least one day a week in the last three months, associated with at least two of these factors, pain and discomfort that are related to defecation, the frequency of defecation being altered, or the stool consistency being altered. So to make this more clear, I put in this little box here, which shows us the exact criteria and this is called the Rome 4 diagnostic criteria. So again, we need recurrent abdominal pain on average at least one day per week in the previous three months associated with two or more of the following. And that is the pain and discomfort related to defecation, a change in the stool frequency, meaning going less or more to the bathroom, and finally, a change in the stool form, which is the appearance, meaning more liquidy, more soft, more hard stools, all these will fall in this category. And of course, the criteria must be fulfilled for the last three months with symptom onset for at least six months before the diagnosis. So now let's talk about the Manning criteria. This criteria focuses on pain relieved by passing a stool, on having incomplete bowel movements, mucus in the stool, and changes in stool consistency. The more symptoms one has, the greater the likelihood of IBS. So in my bottom right, we have the Manning criteria. So just to explain further about this, there must be three or more features that have to be present for at least six months for the Manning criteria to be fulfilled. So the features again are pain being relieved by defecation, pain onset associated with more frequent stools, looser stools with pain onset, abdominal distension, mucus in the stool, and a feeling of incomplete evacuation after defecation. So any three or more of these features that are present for at least six months will fulfill Manning's criteria.
So now let's explore some different treatment options. First of all, we can start off with some lifestyle treatment. Mild signs and symptoms of IBS can often be controlled by managing stress and by making changes in one's diet and lifestyle. The patients are advised to avoid foods that trigger their symptoms, such as wheat, dairy products, citrus fruits, beans, cabbage, milk, and carbonated drinks. They are encouraged to eat more high fiber foods, drink plenty of fluids, exercise regularly, and get enough sleep. And now, some medical treatment for IBS. For the purpose of treatment, IBS can be divided into three types based on the patient's primary symptoms, meaning constipation-predominant IBS, diarrhea-predominant IBS, or mixed. Allocetron is a medication that can be prescribed, and this medication is designed to relax the colon and slow the movement of waste through the lower bowel. This drug is intended for severe cases of diarrhea-predominant IBS in women who haven't responded to other treatments. Something to note, however, is that this drug isn't approved for the use of men. The next drug is eluxodiline, and this can be used to ease diarrhea by reducing muscle contractions and fluid secretion in the intestine. It also increases the muscle tone in the rectum. The next drug is rifaximeme, and this is an antibiotic that can decrease the bacterial overgrowth and diarrhea. So remember we had those different causes of IBS. So rifaximeme is perfect for those cases of IBS caused by bacterial overgrowth or post-gastroenteritis caused IBS. Another drug is lubiprostone, and this drug can increase fluid secretion in the small intestine and help with the passage of stool. And finally, we can also prescribe linaclotide, and this drug also increases fluid secretion in the small intestine to help pass the stool. And that brings us to the end of this video on IBS. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. I hope you find these presentations very interesting and informative. Thank you for all the positive feedback and suggestions that you guys have been throwing my way. I really appreciate all of them and I take them into consideration. And they do help me to make better videos for you guys. Thanks for watching again and bye for now.